Hi, everybody. This is AJ, your favorite host of Everything We Know About the American Heartland. We have something a little bit different from our usual programming this week. We've got an interview with Simon Tam. Simon is the founder, and as you'll hear, not the lead singer of The Slants, an all-Asian American dance rock band. Their new EP, The Band Who Must Not Be Named, is out now, and you can visit uh, theslants.com to find out more. Simon is also the respondent in a case pending before the Supreme Court this term. The question is whether the government can refuse to grant a trademark to the slants if the government determines that the band name is disparaging, or whether such a policy would violate Simon's constitutional rights. We talked about Simon's case on the show in episode three, and we're thrilled to have Simon with us. Okay, well, um, I guess the first thing we really wanted to do is ask you some background information, just, you know, who are you, where you're from, that sort of, whatever you want to give us. Uh, I Honestly, I'm an open book, so I'm happy to answer yeah. anything and everything. Well, where were you born? I was born and raised in San Diego, California, so I grew up there in the early 80s before uh, eventually moving up to Portland, but that wasn't until 2003. How'd you get to Portland? It was uh, my senior year of college at UC Riverside. I was there as a double major, uh, philosophy and religious studies. And two months before graduating, when I got an offer to join a touring punk rock band. So I dropped out of college, moved across the co uh, country, away from all my friends and family to do that. And it ended up being one of my, the best decisions I've ever made in my life. Was this the Slants? No, it was a different band called the Stivs, which kind of sounded like a cross between ACDC and Iggy Pop and the Stooges. So it was just kind of this uh, late 70s, uh, early 80s, like cross between metal and punk. And it was just a lot of fun. It was a band I'd worked with for a couple of years, so I already knew all the guys. Um, but just when, when I received the offer, I, I knew it was exactly the band that I wanted to join. So I, I wasn't going to let anything hold me back, <laughs> and uh, I'm glad I did. I mean, I, I only stayed in that band for about a year and a half before I left, but it was a really good learning experience and, and ended up being really rewarding in terms of just it got me to Portland, and that dramatically shifted my life. And how did you go from that band to the Slants? Well, uh, well I was still in the Stivs at the time, uh, touring and playing music, and that's when I watched a movie, uh, the film Kill Bill. And during that film, I got the inspiration to start The Slants. And it was really kind of out of necessity because I felt like there was such a lack of representation in the Asian American community um, in entertainment, ma mainstream entertainment, not only in movies and TV, but especially especially in music, the, the, the same art that you know I sacrificed everything for. Yeah. And so, like... Well, I so, <clears throat> sorry, Tom. Uh, this is Ruchit. Uh, I wanted to ask you, I guess, uh, you said there was the lack of that. Um, what were you guys doing? I mean, obviously, this is still a very current project, and it's something that you guys are, are passionate about, I know. Um, what did you guys do in the early days to sort of kind of build that awareness and sort of build that representation, as you were talking about? Well, in the early days, it was just me. I was the only person for the first two and a half years. Um, it existed as an idea in my head and some songs that I wrote. Um, but I started building building it out as like any other kind of business project. So I already had a website, uh, social media up and going, uh, things like that. And just by the mere fact of existing was kind of like an act of activism in of itself because there was such a lack of... Of representation, the the fact that I was there, uh, people got really excited. I mean, I would get letters from Asian American youth just thanking me for existing, to, for showing them that it was even possible to have a band. So, um, just the mere act of just having that presence and then beginning to perform was building representation in a field that was pretty much unheard of. I mean, to this day, when I ask people to name any one Asian American band. Uh, other than my own, most people cannot name a single one. 
do you think that's because um so i i'm i'm asian american i'm indian american and so's tom tom i've outed you now the world knows you're indian american <laughs> uh <laughs> but um you know kind of i can relate i think as a as a sort of fellow asian american um you know in terms of music and you know music when you're growing up like do you think your childhood had anything to do with that or do you think like the Asian cultural experience has sort of a different relationship to music and maybe talk about how that relates to sort of your approach. If at all, I might just be, you know, um, impo- not imposing, but you know what I mean? I might just be like projecting, but yeah, I mean, I think it kind of depends on the, I mean, the Asian American community is not a monolithic group. Uh, people don't of all course, have the course, same yeah. experiences and, you know, it yeah, depends yeah, on the generation too. So for a lot of people kind of in my generation growing up in the 80s, we really gravitated towards synth pop music because that was the sound – that was like basically the soundtrack of our childhood. Or people who kind of immigrated yeah. here, it, it conjures up memories of entering the U.S. So bands like The Cure, Depeche Mode, and New Order have a really special place uh, in our lives. Uh, but I think there's, there's a number of factors of why there's a lack of representation I mean, first of all, for a lot of Asian Americans who are recent immigrants, most of the time the parents don't have the luxury of focusing on the arts. They want their kids to succeed academically uh, so that they can be financially yeah. stable. So there's kind of that element. I mean, uh, for better or worse, there's a certain inherent level of privilege with the arts, uh, of both in terms of who gets funded through things like foundations, but also who has the, the peer capacity to allow their kids to do that. Um, and also it's kind of interacting with society in a different kind of way, a society that might be new and might approach arts differently than the respective heritage. Uh, the other part of it is that there's a lot of barriers because when people don't see themselves represented in things like the arts, uh, and TV and drama or other things, they have a hard time even identifying that as a possibility of something they can actually get involved in. And so when you have a music industry that is kind of, unfortunately, really biased against Asian American representation uh, and, and amongst many other kind of marginalized groups, it becomes difficult for people to see themselves in that world. Um, well, one thing we really do want to talk to you about is your case before the Supreme Court. Um, three of us are lawyers, and you have a, a case pending before the United States Supreme Court um, that surrounds the name of your band, The Slants. You registered to trademark it with the trademark office, and they denied your request, um, saying that it would be disparaging toward persons of Asian descent. And so the issue before the Supreme Court is whether that disparagement clause is invalid under the First Amendment. And from a legal perspective, this is just super interesting to us. Um, talking to you is it partially because we want to know how the story of your lawsuit, how did you get there? Uh, you mean originally, like, why did I file an application to begin with or? Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. That started out of a really casual conversation with a friend of mine who's an attorney. I was back in 2009 and he knew the band was blown up. I mean, we were in the press quite a bit. NPR did a story about us and how we were, tackling stereotypes about Asian Americans and we were getting radio play in about 800 stations and so he was really concerned he said you know as an up-and-coming artist you really ought to file a registration for your trademark and I, I was kind of a little bit leery of it at first but you know he kind of explained how a lot of rec major record label deals and sync licensing deals of any kind of significance are pending on on artists who to get the their registered trademarks. And so I thought, okay, it makes sense, especially as we're doing this thing full time and nationally that, that we ought to take those steps. And I remember he said, you know, honestly, as he was trying to kind of reassure me, he said, this thing is only going to cost you a few hundred bucks. And in about five or six months, the whole thing's going to be over. Uh, little did I know it would set me on a much more <laughs> tumultuous path that would last nearly eight years and and that's kind of how we got started we just simply applied um and when i first got the rejection i thought it was a practical joke because he he told me 
that we were denied. And when I asked him the reason why, he said, oh, it's, they say your name is disparaging to persons of Asian descent. And then when I asked, you know, do they, do they know we're of Asian descent? And I kind of was shocked because I said, there's offensive stuff all the time. Um, you know, I didn't even know there was a law against this. What, what does it say? He said, oh, well, you know, he's quoting Section 2A of the Lanham Act by then, saying, can't register marks that are scandalous, immoral, or disparaging, but not disparaging to the general population, but a substantial composite of the reference group. And so in our case, it'd be Asian Americans. And when I asked him, you know, who did they find who was offended by this? He said, nobody. Uh, But they did quote UrbanDictionary.com, and they included a photo of Miley Cyrus and one of Toby Keith pulling their eyes back in a slant-eye gesture. And I thought it was just a joke that, you know, the same kind of stuff that wouldn't be acceptable in a junior high classroom was now being used by the federal government to deny me rights. And that's why we decided to appeal and why we continue to fight. Uh, Because I believe at the end of the day, it's our own community should decide what's best for ourselves, not some government employee who has no connection with the community at all. So was that initial lawyer that you, um, the, the friend that told you to trademark this, the name, did he sort of shepherd you to another set of lawyers to file the lawsuit or how did that work? Uh, no, he actually helped in, in the first two uh, kind of ap- steps of the appeal. So we followed the example of your traditional 2A appeal and, and that if you get um, accused of uh, being disparaging, then every other case before me has done the same kind of thing. You get legal experts, you get uh, legal declarations from members of the community, show examples of your name being used in the community via press or other things. Eventually, we got independent national surveys and a linguistics expert who worked at Duke University, amongst many other things. Um, So he fought a pretty good amount of the way, I mean, the first year, year and a half. But as we were going up against the TTAB, the Trademark Trials and Appeals Board, he wanted to leave private practice. He wanted to give up on the law and take an in-house position. So... At that time, I found a different attorney, uh, Ron Coleman, uh, mainly because he blogged about my case on his website, Likelihood of Confusion. And I remember reading it and seeing the logo where it had the America Super Lawyers logo or something like that. And I thought, well, maybe he knows something about this. And so we we reached out to him and he agreed to take the case on pro bono. And uh, when he took it on, he decided that He basically said, as long as you're arguing the way you are, saying we're not offensive to ourselves, you're going to lose. He said, because nobody's ever won on appeal. If if you've been accused of 2A, nobody has ever won against that accusation in the entire history of trademark law. So he thought he could win by arguing in a different way, through a procedural and evidentiary issues path. And that's why we abandoned our first application and started a new one. When did you first make the First Amendment argument that this was a violation of your free speech rights? Uh, that was after we got out of the TTAB and went to the federal circuit. Um, so the uh, associate attorney, Joel McMull, was doing a lot of the writing back, back then, be- mostly because it was, you know, I was a, a pro bono client. And so he, he was the one kind of doing a lot of that research and had a heavy hand in, in, in that Um the entire premise going to the federal circuit was actually procedural and evidentiary issues that basically um, claims that the examining attorney was violating the trademark examining uh, procedurals manual. But right at the last minute, Joel decided, he's like, you know, I'm just going to throw a First Amendment argument in there for good measure just to see what happens uh, in case the other things don't necessarily fly. And so that's how it kind of got in there. It was more of like an afterthought or a coincidence than anything else. Can I ask you how you got involved with the Eugene Volokh and the UCLA Supreme Court Clinic? Yeah, that was after we won at the federal circuit. And obviously, uh, Eugene had already been writing about our case for some time. Um, I mean, as a champion for free speech, he was he was hoping we would win, uh, which we did. 
Uh, it was once we got to the Supreme Court, we knew that the trademark office was going to appeal. Uh, we we were fairly certain that the Supreme Court was going to grant cert, so we already started looking at uh, different potential allies to to help us. Uh, obviously, I had a number of attorneys try and court me uh, between the Federal Circuit and Supreme Court. Probably about fifty or sixty firms reached out to me asking me to take our case over. Um, but I, at the end of the day, decided that I wanted to stick with the guy who believed in me from the beginning, the guy who who t took me on pro bono for six years, even though nobody in this firm had ever been to the Supreme Court before. I, I just believed that we had the better arguments, so I was confident in their ability. Um, and as we were vetting different people and different experts, um, I'm not sure who suggested it, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day uh, they decided to to reach out to and to work with Stuart Banner at um, at UCLA, and of course Eugene Volokh is there as well. So, so we decided to to partner up with them and and have them kind of be the the lead in, in developing this kind of strategy moving forward. Hey Simon, what did you? I mean, so you know that First Amendment argument was a you know uh, was sort of a creative idea that one of the attorneys came up with and kind of just put it in there. What did you think of of that argument, like when you initially sort of heard it? You know. Well, initially, I, you know, I'm not a honestly, I'm not into law that that much. Into kind of, sure. I, I do policy work around stuff that affects marginalized groups for the city and state, but uh, by no means am I a constitutional attorney. Um, so when I read it, I thought, okay, it seems to make sense. I thought the the kind of really crude arguments that we made at the federal circuit, I said, yeah, that, that kind of makes sense. Uh, I, I thought that we would get it mostly on the procedural and evidentiary issues because I, I saw a very clear path forward. And since what I knew about the federal circuit was that they were a really, really technical court, I thought that those were the things that they would be interested in. And honestly, the whole time I was kind of a little bit frustrated uh, because I wanted to move forward on clearing the record that we, in fact, are not disparaging. But our whole legal argument was on the premise that um, the, the procedural and technical issues presuppose disparagement to begin with, that, that they were wrong in interpreting the name, and therefore we had no reason to even need to defend it because they already violated the procedural uh, issues. Uh, so, I mean, even to this day, because the evidentiary record is locked, um, there's a certain part of me that wishes I could have addressed the, the misinformation kind of perpetuated by the trademark office. But at the end of the day, I, I think it was important, and especially once we got out of the federal circuit um, and, and hearing the ACLU argue on our behalf and, and really vetting those ideas out before the federal circuit, I became a, a firm believer that absolutely that the the way forward to protect civil rights was to protect civil liberties like the First Amendment. Uh, so one of the things that might be curious, I think, to our listeners and is certainly curious to me um, is, you know, you're you're clearly a very educated guy. You're very involved in this case. Um, you know, so as a client in this situation, and especially, you know, going before the Supreme Court, how involved did you get? I mean, could you veto arguments? Um, how did the process even work? And this is sort of viewed from your perspective, you know, um, you know, given how sort of involved, obviously, you are um, in this case and in this in this advocacy. Yeah, I mean, I was much more involved in the earlier steps. I would say the the more advanced the case got, the less involved I became in terms of the the legal argument that was being developed. Um, in the, in the beginning, especially when I was working with my first attorney, I was there helping write the briefs with him uh, because even the first attorney, I, by the, when we started appealing, uh, I was taken on pro bono. So I was the one reaching out to directly to the expert reports, um, you know, the surveyist, the linguistics expert, the community leaders that were writing in. I was the one helping develop and recruit legal declarations and that sort of thing. Uh, so I, because I was so deeply involved in the case from the beginning, um, the the early part of our 
journey to the federal circuit was in large part like I would get drafts and I would be able to comment on them and help our, uh, develop some of the arguments or, or to like ask questions about teasing certain information out or correcting information and that sort of thing. By the time the, the final brief was, was written, very, very little bit. I mean, I would get kind of um, invited to conference calls, some basic strategy sessions and that sort of thing. But, but by then, um, we were mainly de- deferring to the First Amendment experts at that point. Did you go to Washington for the oral argument? I did. Yeah, it was really important to me that the that the justices look in the eyes of the people they're making decisions about. I, I don't know something about it uh, from like a moral or ethical perspective was it was it was really important. So um, our entire band went. Uh, we launched a crowdfunding campaign so fans could help um, help us afford to be able to 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 be there in person. So what was it like from your perspective? At oral argument, it was it was a bit surreal and exciting, and frustrating, and inspiring all at the same time. <laughs> um, did, did you just want to jump in and be like, "Let me take this one"? <laughs> there were a number of times, yes, uh, that that I wish I could have answered a few things. Uh, of course, I could not imagine the mounts the the immense amount of pressure that my attorney who was arguing before the court was under. I mean, that, that just seems uh, quite quite a challenge. Uh, though there were times where I was like, man, even I would answer that trademark question differently. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I just had to watch. And sometimes it felt like I was really disconnected with it. And they're, I mean, they're arguing and saying a lot of things about me or a lot of things about my band for 55 minutes. And sometimes I felt like they weren't even talking about me, like they, or especially when the solicitor general was talking about my band and our work. I was like, you don't know me. You've never met me. You're just being very presumptuous about who we are based on a few casual internet searches. And, and he was even presenting information that was uh, false, which is a little frustrating to me. I mean, even the government brief, it starts out saying that, I am the lead singer of the slants, although any quick search on Google will tell you in less than three seconds that I've never been the lead singer of the band. Uh, so I'm like, can't these guys even Google basic facts correctly? <laughs> but, you know, at the end of the day, um, I'm glad I was able to be a part of it, to see it in person and kind of see those things unfold and, and see that part of democracy um, and, and experience it in person. Were there any protests or anything like that surrounding your case? Um, no, there weren't any protests. We There were a whole lot of people there. Like Apparently, people had lined up since midnight um, before, before our cases we heard. And when we walked out of the court, the entire plaza was filled with, with people. It was just this unbelievable crowd. And as we were descending the steps, um, it was... It was unlike anything I'd ever seen. The the entire crowd erupted in applause and started cheering us as we were walking out. So that was pretty, uh, pretty inspiring and uplifting. I had, by the time I reached the bottom steps, uh, two high schoolers came up to me. Their parents let them ditch school and fly across the country to be there in person. And while they didn't make the oral arguments, they didn't they didn't get into line fast enough. Um, we we did chat afterwards, and they were saying how they were and so inspired by our band's story that they wanted to go into public policy development because of us. Uh, and I was impressed not only because of that, but I was like, you're a sophomore in high school, and you know what public policy development is? This is awesome. So, so that was really, really amazing to see. That's cool. Yeah, then there was other groups of, like, Asian-American kids who were like, thank you for standing up for us, like, this is only one of four or five cases that's ever gone before the Supreme Court to talk about Asian American rights and identity. So they were just really moved by it and wanted to get into music and to activism themselves. I mean, the whole thing was just uh, so thrilling and, and, and made me think like this is worth it because it's so much bigger than, than, than mm-hmm. the band. 
Well, you know, on that point, like one of the things that we, we noticed when we were looking at your website and you've talked about a little bit is, you know, you didn't think that the word slant as you're using it is disparaging or racist or anything as the, the government is alleging, right? Um, let me ask you, when they were making these arguments at, at the Supreme Court, because one of the issues there was whether the government even has the right to say some trademarks can be disparaging or some trademarks cannot be disparaging. Do you have any thoughts on that? Do you think the government should be allowed to decide at all whether some are or not, are not disparaging? I No, I don't think the government should at all. I mean, the government itself says that they they don't really want to be in the business of dis- deciding what's disparaging. Supposedly, it's supposed to be the opinion's of the reference group. The problem is they never bother asking the reference group. They mm-hmm. never take a measurement to see if truly a substantial composite of that group does take offense or does find a mark disparaging. I th- and I think the government should, shouldn't be in that business for a number of reasons. Number one, they tend to get it wrong. Um, they, they tend to not recognize things like reappropriation. And as such, what happens is the law as it's applied gets disproportionately applied to communities of color and members of the LGBTQ community because those tend to be the very groups that engage in reappropriation and reclaiming of formerly stigmatizing labels. So when you target words or phrases or ideas that marginalized groups are using, you're by its very nature targeting those groups themselves. And when you place additional burdens on them, like requiring them to uh, take on surveys or get experts and other sort of thing, you're burdening already burdened communities and asking them to make an argument in which they will never win. And I think that's frankly inherently wrong. The other part of it is I, I don't believe that the cure for be- for hate speech is censorship. I believe it's actually better speech, more nuanced speech, and that in the end of the day, in the marketplace of ideas, the truly best ideas will conquer, will win. As lo- Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that if, if the government truly cared about stopping racism and using the trademark office as the vehicle to do so, then I would argue that they should begin by canceling the registrations of the KKK, Stormfront, mm-hmm. and other hate groups identified by places like the Southern Poverty Law Center. But they've never done a motion to do so. In, fa- in fact, the only times they've really done anything to cancel a mark would be uh, uh, the Washington football team. Let me ask you, you know, on, that's a that's a good point that you bring up, that they haven't, you know, canceled very many marks at all. Um, are there any marks that you think that, you know, shouldn't be a mark, for example, you know, racial epithets, for example? Not really. I mean, I think there are other areas of of the Lanham Act that protect. I mean, things that, like, I don't think you should be able to use somebody's name without their permission. I don't, like, libel. Um, yeah. But that's already protected in other ways. Uh, we know that free speech isn't absolutely free. I mean, the Supreme Court already said, you know, has a list of things like fighting words, things that incite violence. I mean, obviously, those shouldn't be registrable trademarks and that they aren't protected by the First Amendment at all. But at the end of the day, if there are ideas that are protected by the First Amendment, then yeah, I think that trademark law should be made to be consistent with copyright law in that um, we allow ideas to flourish. Because if you if you find a way to try and put some kind of condition on it, like, you know, we're going to um, ascertain the context or the intent of the applicant, or we're going to make sure that uh, evidence is taken from, from the reference group, well... By its very nature, the most privileged and powerful members of society will find ways around it. I mean, I think it is extremely naive to think that the Washington Redskins would not find a way around it by either paying Native American groups to to say that they don't find the team name offensive or manipulating some kind of study. And, and that's the the nature of it. But we can't be so obsessed with wanting to punish people like Dan Snyder or... Um, controversial football teams like the Redskins, we can't be so obsessed with punishing them with, to the point where we actually accept that the collateral damage will be experienced by marginalized groups who don't have the same resources to make an appeal as a very large NFL football franchise. 
So, it, you know, I, I noticed on your website you had a couple of posts about the Redskins and how, you know, their uh, trademark is not the same as your trademark, and I, I tend to agree with, with you on that. But, um, you know, if you win at the Supreme Court and the courts use your case as a basis for retaining the trademark of the Redskins, would you have any regrets about that? I, as odious as I find their name to be, at the end of the day, I, I would not because I would rest well knowing that the government would no longer be using people's identities against them. You know, when we applied to register the slants and they they decided that our name was a racial slur that it was disparaging we asked them we said why um you know slant itself is not an inherent racial slur so why this case and why not the dozens and dozens of times you've registered the term before i mean as it stands now my case is the only one in all of u.s history to be denied of registration on the premise of it being racist or disparaging to Asians. The trademark office said it is incontestable that the applicant is of Asian descent and part of an Asian ban and thus the association. In other words, I was too Asian to use the mark that the reality is that anyone can register a trademark for the slants as long as they're not Asian because in the eyes of the trademark office, if people go to the slants.com and they see photos of Asian people, They'll automatically think a racial slur instead of the other possible definitions, uh, including the positive definitions or neutral ones. We find this time and time again that these communities are targeted. The ACLU did a pretty extensive survey on this. Uh, Megan Carpenter, formerly at Texas A&M and now the dean at UNH, also did an extensive study finding that out of every ca- all the cases that um, get cited with disparagement, the overwhelming majority of them tend to be small businesses and small businesses owned by people of color and people of the LGBTQ community. And at the end of the day, that can't stand. That's not justice. That's not an equitable form of law. And while some people say, well, you can always appeal, you can always argue, you can always uh, provide more evidence, we shouldn't have to. We shouldn't have to alter our language. We shouldn't have to change our method of social change simply to satisfy the subjective nature of some trademark attorney who works for the USPTO. That's, to me, not right. And of course, people will make the other argument. I mean, the trademark office says this all the time, that it they're not violating or bridging my First Amendment rights because I can still use the trademark, I just can't have the trademark registration. And to me, it sounds a lot like what people used to tell my sister, that well, you can still live with your partner, you just can't get married. In other words, you can still have the benefits of marriage or like a marital-like relationship, you just can't have the certificate. And there's just something wrong about that, about using people's identities against them and treating them like second-class citizens. You might as well continue saying, you can still ride the bus, you just got to sit in the back. I mean, it, we know it's not a government program. It might be run by the government, but it's funded entirely by applicants, not tax dollars, so it's not a subsidy. We know it's not government speech in that the government doesn't control the, the, the way the message is conveyed or the design or context of it whatsoever. That's up to the applicants themselves. So it's not entirely government speech. It's not entirely a government program. And therefore, I think that the Supreme Court is really going to be skeptical about finding ways to fit it in, like fit it into the pegged hole that the trademark office is kind of designing. Something that um, really stuck out for me, I, I, uh, I, you know, I, I think that you've from this interview and and from some of the things you read that you've written, I sort of am am struck by how much you you've thought about um, like race in in America and particularly whiteness. You wrote an article for I mean, a post about, you know, whiteness history month and, and sort of, whiteness is as sort of like a, a default almost in in american culture um and i, I think you you said something earlier that that was really sort of thought provoking for me that that these sort of non disparagement clauses um the way that they're the way that they're enforced has has a, a disparate impact for uh small businesses and particularly minority owned small businesses i mean do do you think do you think that that is sort of in part caused by 
sort of the 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 role of of whiteness in american history or do do you think that it it mostly is is about well i guess i should ask you i mean wh- wh- where do you think that fits in i i mean i think that's part of it i think we have institutionalized racism and bias in our country there's no doubt that uh, whiteness provides an advantage in navigating our society, be it through education, through, you know, we studies have been down, done showing that if you have a white sounding name, you're 50% more likely to get a call back for a job than if you have a, a 50, uh, a black sounding name, even though if the resume is exactly the same. Um, I've been using that to my advantage all my life. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's nearly every single area of law. And I think it, it's just because it permeates our society. And I think that's part of the issue here. You know, when a governor appointed board of Asian American leaders here in Oregon wrote the trademark office asking um, which Asian American groups were working with the trademark office to determine that our name was disparaging. And who, who did they speak with? The trademark office said uh, nobody. They said, but our organization is very diverse and we have many Asian Americans who live in Washington, D.C. Their basic answer is like, hey, uh, Kevin in the cubicle down the hall is Asian, so obviously I understand all of his racialized experiences. I mean, it, it's a bit ridiculous. But then again, it's a bit ridiculous to assume that any one human being can understand the experiences and nuances of every English word and term and as how it's experienced by marginalized groups. It's an impossible standard. And when you have words like disparagement, scandalous, or um, immoral, those tend to be subjective in nature because people are going to find different things disparaging. They're going to find different things immoral than, than another person. And so by default, who tend to be the decision makers in this country? tend to be white males, people with privilege and money, and they're going to not necessarily understand those of low-income communities or or people who might be transgender or people who just have a different lifestyle than they do. And so crafting laws for that either becomes paternalistic and presumptuous, or you have to find a way forward that opens things up so that those communities have a chance to empower themselves with a different kind of message. The... Uh, Simon, I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, it, I, I feel like someone could be looking at this and, and saying that, that section of the Lanham Act, um, you know, it, even if it is a little patronizing, it's intended to protect uh, against disparagement. And or, I mean, they, they might say that, right? They might say that, listen, it's designed to be a piece of public policy that says we don't want to institutionalize disparagement or give it credence. So I, I think your view here today is, listen, maybe it's not the government's job, and maybe it's definitely not the, the trademark office's job to decide what is disparaging and what is not. So what would you say, I guess, in response to that? Well, I mean, I would say it's not their job because they tend to get it wrong. And I think people forget that it's not about not only about intention, but it's also about impact as well. So you have laws that have disparate impact, I think, should be examined much more closely. Uh, For example, stop and frisk laws. They're designed to protect society, to protect us against, you know, illegal weapons and drugs and that sort of thing. And despite that, we have every single study ever conducted on drug usage in America leading and showing us how whites use drugs at a substantially higher rate than people of color. Who are the people that get stopped and frisked? In New York when they actually enacted this law. Well, they didn't patrol the wealthy financial district of of New York. They went to low-income communities and communities of color. When you you talk about other laws that were designed and intended to protect the country, um, at the end of the day, the government might say, like, this is ultimately to protect our most vulnerable people, but when it's enacted, it's not necessarily done so. The government, through all of its positive intentions, um, might have used all that intention to lock up people into concentration camps during World War II. You know, people of Japanese descent. Oh, they are intending to protect us. They are intending to give the land back to Japanese families who were rightfully Americans, but they never did so. I mean, so intention is... You can't just stop there. 
because it has to we have to also look at impact and that impact should be measured by how it is actually hurting marginalized communities people of color uh, in this country the, the our biggest struggles aren't against hate speech because I'm, let me tell you people use hate speech whether they have a registered trademark or not they will find ways to offend our biggest struggles have to do with system, systemic and institutionalized forms of discrimination, i.e. difficulty in securing loans or navigating um, uh, our social system because it's a system that's designed to help the privileged. Yeah, no, I mean, that's that's super interesting. I, I think what you're saying about um, going beyond the intention is correct. I mean, uh it's a, and the reason I asked it honestly is to sort of provoke that thought, right? Because I think it's a question that some people might have, um, you know, which is, uh, it's a law that's designed to sort of potentially, potentially designed to help minorities. Um, it's a law designed to distract from the real conversation of where racism takes place in this country. <laughs> it's it's to say, yeah. hey, hey, we're doing you a service. We're protecting your group. But the reality is like you're not doing anything to protect our group. You're stripping our rights away. And and it's like they can say, well, that's not the intention of the law. But th again, that distracts from the fact that we were expecting the trademark office of all the offices and departments of the government, using them to legislate morality. It's a pretty bit ridiculous, especially when you consider how inconsistent they are and how to, out of touch and out under resourced they are. Um, it, it, it just it makes me really question: Do they really have those intentions or not? Because if, again, at the end of the day, if they really are intending to protect our communities, hey, let's start with the KKK. I'll I'll gladly support that. Hey, Simon, um, let me ask you a question. Um, we, going back to our earlier conversation about, you know, this is one of the first trademarks that the trademark office um, really went after. Do you know why or do you have any guesses as to why they they denied your trademark from the get go? Oh, they were afraid of a political controversy. I mean, we actually called the examining attorney like s six months in. Um, my, my first attorney called them and said, you know, what's your problem? What's, what's the deal? Obviously, these guys are supported the, by the community. The examining attorney said, honestly, it's above me. It's, it's coming from above. We don't want any kind of political fallout. We don't want more attention on this issue uh, because there's already a lot of attention given due to pro football's case. And so we're just trying to avoid any kind of controversy. And even then, the trademark offices. If you provide a national survey, if you prov provide expert reports, and you do all this stuff, um, we'll likely just remove the objection altogether. The problem is when we provided all of those things and then some, they rejected it. They rejected our survey. They rejected all of the dictionary experts. Uh, essentially, even though thousands of Asian Americans weighed in on the issue um, and showing that an overwhelming majority of them supported our case, the trademark office said that's not good enough. It, they said it's not good enough because we got UrbanDictionary.com, we got this Wikipedia page that lists slant as a possible racial slur. They, they found a dictionary of British English from 1939 that they quoted from, not even American English, but British English. And they used AsianJokes.com and they thought that was sufficient to demonstrate a substantial composite of Asian Americans. They did not speak to a single Asian American. And so, you know, going through this process myself, I don't have a lot of faith that they would do right by, by our communities in the future, no matter what they say their intentions are. Has this case upset your faith in the government as a whole? Absolutely. <laughs> Not that I had a whole lot to begin with, but I mean, when I think about it, is this really justice? I've spent eight years of my life fighting in the legal system, and I didn't even commit a crime. So for those who are falsely accused of drug possession or murder or these other crimes, like how much more difficult is it for them? I mean, it's, it's hard to look at the news these days and believe that the, the system is being efficient and fair and just. Uh, but seeing it from the back end, it, it's, it's even more difficult to believe in it. Because at the end of the day, even if we win, whether it's on statutory grounds or constitutional grounds, 
um, at the end of the day, even if the Supreme Court unanimously says, you know what, trademark office, you really screwed Simon over, it's not like they're going to give me my money back. It's not like they're going to give me almost a decade of my life back. They can't. They're just going to go, well, here's your certificate for trademark registration. Okay, goodbye. And like at the end of the day, is that really justice? Uh, I don't know. So Simon, maybe I don't have a last question, but maybe a final thought that is maybe uh, maybe more optimistic. Uh, so I think I look at it in you know having not had to do anything. Uh, <laughs> I look at it as actually pretty awesome, and I don't mean that just as an intellectual curiosity, but I, I mean that as this is sort of how the law develops in the country. And I think to have so many interested attorneys, I mean, 60 attorneys or 60 law firms that were ready to help you, uh, you know, probably all on a pro bono basis, uh, to have the ACLU, to have all of these groups uh, say, you know, hey, listen, Simon's First Amendment rights matter. And in fact, this area of the First Amendment matters. Uh, Even if somebody might think, well, it's just this obscure little area of the law that's really just trademark on whether or not you can get something that – some person might think is disparaging, but other people don't, right? So I look at all of those things and I I say that's a huge, uh, huge victory. You know what I mean? Um, And that's, you know what I mean? So I I think in in many ways, it's a, it it is a system that works, right? It it maybe works rather slowly, but but I leave it in a, personally in a much more optimistic uh, sort of place that, uh, you know, you weren't, you weren't denied, um, you know, access to the courthouse. weren't denied that, and um, you know, a lot of a lot of people that that are in positions either similar to yours, or uh, that want to be, let's say, activists and commercial at the same time, because that's certainly a little bit of what getting a trademark is about, uh, are able to do it. You know. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, I'm except I'm just extremely humbled and grateful that so many people have come to the aid and yeah justice is a very very long process but i i think about all the people who've come before who just gave up because they were so frustrated by the system yeah and and that's why i decided i'm going to try and persist um a lot of times i when i think about why i undertook this journey i i think back um on one of my favorite quotes from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who said that the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And when I think about that, I think, well, you know, the reality is that that moral arc does not bend on its own. It takes people who are passionate and persistent and who are willing to do whatever it takes to fight for, for civil liberties and for the vulnerable groups out there. And, and that's why I persisted. Is my faith shaken in the system? Yeah, but it doesn't mean I'm still not going to critique it or try and bend it or work it however I can to make it a more just system in the future. But I, I do think that at the end of the day, we, we see more people um, participating in democracy than ever. And I hope that with my case, whether we win or lose, that these conversations about racial identity and who gets to wield the power will continue. And I hope that people will continue to fight for um, their their civil liberties, you know, regardless of what happens with my case. I, I totally agree with that. I think, I think that's totally, uh, I think that's inspiring. I don't, I don't know that uh, any of us have any more questions. I really appreciate you taking the time to call in and, and talk to us about this. Do you, um, where on the internet can people find you? Um, if they're wanting more information about the band, they can go to theslants.com. We just released a new album, uh, which we're dedicating to the trademark <laughs> office. It's called The Band Who Must Not Be Named. Uh, so we have a lot of new music out there. We're on, we're on tour right now, um, going from coast to coast across the country. So we have about three more weeks of that before we go home, finish an album, and then hit the road once more. Uh, if people are interested in my individual writing and activism work, they can just go to simontam.org. Oh, uh, one one thing we do do on our show, um, and I was hoping you could indulge us, is uh, at the end of every episode, we each sort of just talk about something, uh, an article or a YouTube video or something we read recently that we what we found inspiring or at the very least entertaining. Do you have uh, one little nugget, one, one, one book, article, CD you can recommend? 
<laughs> uh, well, we, we've been listening to a lot of Kendrick Lamar's new album <laughs> that dropped fairly recently. I think that was that was quite amazing. And uh, something that I rediscovered last night as as I was doing the the long drive across uh, New York over overnight was uh, Fresh Prince and DJ Jazzy Jeff's classic album. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm I'm the DJ. He's the ra- or he's the DJ. I'm the rapper. Uh, so a lot of good stuff. I mean, we're just, we listen to a ton of music on the road as we're driving because we spend so much time on the bus. Uh, so to me, there's always fun stuff out there in in, in, in the world of music. I love it. We'll come through Austin, man. Yeah, we'll have to come back to Austin again. Maybe. Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'd love to buy you a drink. Hey, so you know, instead of the drink, oh, I'll take barbecue any day. <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> 